Right, okay. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you, Eleanor and Annika for the invitation to speak today. It's really terrific to join this conversation. Um, and as sort of Michael suggested, my uh, talk today will build on research um, that's already been published in Tate Papers and Sculpture Journal, which examines Barbara Hepworth's relationship with her commercial dealers, Gampofis. Um, by way of a little bit of background, Hepworth signed a contract with the London Gallery Gamp Office in 1955 and was represented by the gallery until 1972 when there was an acrimonious split. But at the start of her professional relationship with Gamp Office, she developed a close friendship with the director's brothers Charles and Peter Gampel and Charles's wife Kay, who was the gallery manager. Correspondence held in the Gampel Feast and Tate archives show Hepworth regularly professing her regard, loyalty and friendship to the Gampels right up until the moment that she left the gallery. The blurred professional and personal relationship between Hepworth and the Gampels makes, I think, a fascinating aspect of Hepworth scholarship, and um, particularly in light of um, uh, of um, Penelope Curtis's advocacy of the need to look beyond Nichol the nicholson moore garbo axis that um, up until probably uh, uh, fairly recently um, that has sort of structured uh, Hepworth scholarship. So we need to think about um, other people, events and relationships that influenced Hepworth and the course of her career. Um, so in thinking about Hepworth and photography in relation to Gampel Feast for today's workshop, I identified two areas of research that I think have yet to be fully considered in Hepworth scholarship. The first, um, which is the way in which photographs and colour transparencies were integral to selling sculpture. And I think um, in the introduction blurb for today's workshop, um, there's reference to these workbooks. And I think there's quite a lot to say about how these workbooks operated within a commercial setting. But I'm going to set that aside um, and perhaps we can talk about it in the discussion, because today I want to talk about um, photographs of Hepworth and her studio taken by Charles Gampel. Charles, Charles Gampel was a prolific amateur photographer and throughout the 1950s until his death in 1973, he undertook a variety of self-initiated projects. Between 1958 and 68, he made at least six visits to the Canadian Arctic, the region now known as Nunavik, and photographed Inuit communities as they transitioned from nomadic to settled societies. The Canadian National Archives holds over 12,000 images taken by Gampel. He also photographed working class and migrant communities in London's East End, and in those contexts was, according to his son, René Gampel, regarded by his subjects as a slightly eccentric Frenchman who just wanted to take pictures. Uh, what was um, in those work, when he was working in those environments, Charles worked undercover, so to speak, and certainly did not reveal that he was an art dealer of aristocratic descent. Importantly though, Charles's interest in, in photography slipped into his professional life as an art dealer. So we have informal observational portraits of Henry and Arena Moore at home at Hog Hoglands, of Nicholson and his cat in St. Ives, of Nicholson playing golf in Switzerland. But we also know that Charles took photographs of sculptures and artworks in context, as at Rod Robert Adams's display at the Venice Biennale, while some images, such as that of Peter Lanyon, demonstrates that Charles was interested in more experimental forms of portraiture. So with regard to Hepworth, um, Charles's photographs can, I think, be divided into three broad categories, the sculptures, the studio and portraits. So firstly, looking at um, photographs of sculptures, I'm not entirely convinced that Charles's photographs of Hepworth sculptures in her St. Ives, Ives garden are particularly interesting from a compositional or an aesthetic um, point of view or reading. Um, they seem quite similar in many ways to lots of the other images um, that are in circulation. And so they're perhaps more useful as comparative images as documents showing which works were displayed, how and where. So that in itself makes them valuable. Um, but I do think that some of Charles's 
photographs of sculptures are very interesting, as particularly in the moments when they are um, when he captures people looking at or experiencing or engaging with the, uh, Hepworth sculptures. And I'm really fascinated by these two pictures because I think it says a lot about Charles as an as a person that on seeing some children kicking a sculpture, he lets them get on with it rather than put on his art dealer hat and says, no, no, you must not kick the sculptures. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, now, in terms of Hepworth Studio, we're perhaps more familiar with the staged empty views of the Palais de Danse taken by professionals like this one by Brian Butt, which has been reproduced multiple times. And Charles also took this sort of image. But most of his images of the new studio taken in February 1961 um, offer a behind the scenes view, which as a researcher trying to get to Hepworth and her working practices are, I think, invaluable. Again, not all the images are compositionally successful and perhaps reflect Charles's working methods of taking lots of snaps and then cropping and selecting images um, using a pencil on contact sheets that would then be uh, enlarged as individual prints. But simultaneously, his images um, offer us otherwise unseen views of the messy studio, the, the studio in use, which is, I think, really interesting. While on other occasions, he just gives us very strange, unusual views. Um, mm. uh, within this category of studio uh, images, there are also some revealing photographs of Hepworth physically engaging with her sculptures, which um, again, problematizes my own groupings and uh, of the archival images and trying to separate them out. So my final grouping are portrait photographs of Hepworth. And these images range from, range from informal snapshots to formal staged portraits. And some images fall somewhere in between. Um, Charles's Gam Charles Gampel's photographs of Hepworth show, I think, a level of intimacy between artist and art dealer that is highly unusual. It's inconceivable to me, for example, that Hepworth's later dealer, Harry Fisher of Marlborough Fine Art, would have hung out, hung out in Hepworth's studio taking photographs of her. He was busy selling, selling, selling. So what was the relationship between Hepworth and Charles Gampel? And what role did photography play in establishing and maintaining that relationship? I'm interested in the power dynamics at play here between artist and dealer, female sitter and male photographer, and professional artist and amateur photographer. In each of these pairings, it's unclear to me whether those dynamics are equal or not, and if the power relation is the same in each pairing. But clearly by the mid 1950s, Hepworth is used to being photographed. So what did it mean to be photographed by Charles? Was she merely humoring an eccentric art dealer in order to secure a contract and maintain commercial representation? The Gampel Feast archives hold a fascinating letter written by Hepworth on October 29th, 1955, and I'll read it out. Dearest Charles, I think the photos you took of me on the roof are most amusing. They are alive and informal. So please do use any of these four photos, including your enlargement. In fact, I like them so much, I should love to have, I mean buy, some copies to send my children and my parents. Would it be possible? I also like the vague one of me wandering in the tropical jungle, but please do destroy the awful ones taken outside my studio door. Your photography is fine, my face is difficult. Hepworth continues the letter at the top of the page by appealing to Charles. When you come down again, please do try and get a good close up of me for general purposes. I haven't a decent one. And she signs off along the side of the letter, Ben hasn't shown me his yet, much love Barbara. And I think um, the photos that she's referring to, Ben's photos are the ones of the cat, which I showed at the start of this presentation. So um, there's a lot to unpick in this letter. And although these photographs from the Gampel Feast archive are undated, I'm asserting here that these are the images on the rooftop, the informal alive, images on the rooftop that Hepworth is discussing, although I may be wrong and I'm happy to be told otherwise. Um, 
with regard to Hepworth's reference of the tropical jungle photograph, I wonder if this image reproduced in the pictorial biography is taken by Charles. We know that the pictorial biography doesn't have image credits, and I think it's just too much of a coincidence that this photograph is, is reproduced on the same page as the Gampoffi's 1956 exhibition catalogue. So there's a question mark there that I'm really interested in. Um, and we can take a number of other things from the 1955 letter too. Hepworth's acutely aware of her own image. She thinks her face is difficult. And in another um, note to Charles, she outrightly says that she's not photogenic. She asks him to, asking him to destroy specific prints shows the desire to control which portraits of her are in public circulation. But simultaneously, she clearly thinks Charles has captured something of her. And so I understand her letter to show that she trusts him enough as a person and respects him enough as a photographer to think him capable of, cap of taking a decent portrait. So again, these photographs in the Hepworth family archive aren't dated, but they nonetheless seem to fulfill Hepworth's request. However, Charles's staged portraits of Hepworth conform to photographic conventions that had arguably been established early in her career of, of photographing Hepworth um, looking through or standing beside or next to or touching her sculpture. And um, I find these images to be portraits of Hepworth's public persona. And perhaps they exemplify Roland Barthes' proposition that one is always cast in terms of the already represented. So while I think these are really beautiful photographs of Hepworth and her sculpture, um, in comparison, um, these staged honorific portraits, when compared to his naturalistic informal ones, I think the more informal ones are much more interesting. And I get much more of a sense of Hepworth as a person. And I wonder to what extent was Hepworth knowingly conforming to a pre-existing image of her as a sculptor and embracing and using that stereotype and whether or not she was in fact using those conventions as a mask to um, De, uh, as a mask for her public persona while keeping the lively informal portraits uh, private and for her family. So I don't think I've answered uh, many questions, but hopefully I've set up a lot of uh, propositions and uh, que further questions for discussion. And I hope I've demonstrated that, the, that I think the personal and professional relationship between Barbara Hepworth and Charles Gampel is really blurry and really complicated. And to me, it's that uncertainty which makes this particular aspect of Hepworth's photographic trace so interesting. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much.